My name is Jack Burgess. Welcome back. This time I'm going to talk about a different type of project, another construction project. Um, but I want to go back in time at first. I started modeling the YV in 1973, primarily because of this book. Hank Johnson came out with this book in 1965. Fortunately, our library had a copy. Um, it had a lot of photos, a lot of information that I needed to build models. Uh, the book cost $12 at that time. I couldn't afford it, but I had a birthday coming up in a few months and my parents bought that book for me for my birthday. I found out later that the same author came out with this book uh, a year earlier, and I think this was kind of a test to see if there was an audience. This book has a liquidation notice. The liquidation notice uh, was prepared by the scrapper of the railroad in 1945 listing all of the equipment that he wanted to sell, the locomotives, water tanks, all kinds of stuff. I didn't know about it until I got this book and saw the first page, and, and it didn't dawn on me that it was bigger than that. This is the actual liquidation notice. It's several pages, six pages. Uh, there's a lot of information in here. One that caught my interest is this one, which lists that the YV had a weed burner. I didn't know anything about weed burners. And so one of my goals that I've mentioned before is to eventually scratch build every piece of equipment the YV had, all of the box cars, flat cars, so forth. And so I didn't know when the YV actually bought the weed burner. So I wrote a letter to Fairmont Railway Motors since they were the one that had built the weed burner and sold it to the YV, asking him when they bought it. And I got this letter back and explained that they not only bought a, the weed burner, but an extinguisher car and another car. And the YV bought them in 1942. So that meant that if I built it, I couldn't put it on the layout because I modeled 1939. And if, if I built something that was gone by 1939, it goes into a display case. What they also sent me were five drawings. This is one of them. This is a drawing of the weed burner. They also sent me the in view, overhead view, so forth. So that was kind of intriguing. But having plans for that weed burner kind of got my mind going. I didn't do anything about it for a long time. Eventually about um, 10 years ago, I decided to build it. But since it could not be on my layout, I decided to build it in Proto 48, also called O scale, but with correct thicknesses of all the wheels and so forth. So that's what I want to talk about. It was a very interesting project that grew and grew and grew. So the first step is research. Uh, I wrote to Fairmont um, and a bunch of other people about photos of a weed burner, specifications, and so forth. One of the things I got was this spec sheet, and it lists all the specifications for it. It shows it with a their car that pulls it. It was not self-powered, but it did have a engine and so forth. But that was to, to run the process. So I've got about 3,800 photos of the YV equipment and buildings and so forth. I have one photo of this car when it was on the YV. This is it. You'll see it, that it's in the very background. It actually proves it was there, although there was no doubt that they owned it. I'm kind of surprised that no one took pictures of it. But I think the hobby of railroad photography at that time was, one, take pictures of locomotives, try to get a picture of every locomotive a railroad might have, some typical cars, uh, stuff that was sitting around. I know that a lot of rail fans, when they went to one of the two fan trips on the YV, were in the yards because there are photos of equipment. And each photo is a little bit different perspective. And so you could see that these guys were in a half circle shooting pictures and a power pole in the background kind of move. Uh, but this is the only one of the weed burner. Maybe it was in a position that no one knew about. It. It's hard to say. I was also able to get this color photo. It's really a black and white photo 
that's been colorized because I have that same exact shot in black and white. But it shows it in operation. This thing was designed to burn weeds along the track. Um, that was all it could do. It used diesel fuel, had a 500 gallon tank of diesel fuel, had a pump that would pump it into these, these four burners. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit more on that when we get to the, the model. But basically, we'd be pulled down the track and just trailing fire. And then it would be followed by another car, motor car, pulling a water car at 500 gallons of water that they would be putting out the fires. Because what they wanted to do was burn basically a couple of feet outside of each of the tie lines. And so that stuff that would come down from the stack or whatever would not start a a fire. The only fire that I know of, and, and there may have been other fires, but one of them that was well known is the very last run, the last day the railroad was in operation. Some rail fans talked to the crew ahead of time, said, we're going to be at such and such a place. When you come by, can you just put on the smoke and make a great photo, which they did, and it caught the grass on fire. So a final, final send away. I had one person that sent me a number of photos and spec sheets. This is one of the photos he had for me. It's a good side view of the car. Another photo shows the end of the car. So I started building this about 2012, I think. What I want to do now is show you some pictures of it when it was under construction so you kind of get an idea of what went into the project and then we'll get into the model itself. So this first one shows it under construction. The entire frame is brass. I made some notes and I wrote an article about actually building this that was in the um, Narrow Gauge Short Line Gazette. I was hearing away that the frame had to be parallel and perpendicular, you know, right angles and so forth. And so I actually built a jig out of plywood, strips of strip wood, glued in place, and use calipers to make sure everything is parallel and use that when I soldered the frame together. Because I knew that if there was a little bit of an error in the frame, I would have problems all the way up. Everything would rely on that. It's just like a house. If you don't have two of the walls square, everything's going to have problems. Building flooring is going to have problems, so forth. So. I know I spent a lot of time making sure that that step was right on. So the next photo was taken about uh, two weeks later. The diesel tank is on it. I don't think it was soldered in place yet, but it's starting to, sh to build up. I've got the wheels on. The wheels were the only part that I purchased. Everything else was scratch built. This next shot is a close-up of showing two of the four burners. You can see there were counterbalance springs there. Those were built by taking brass tubing, taking soft wire and wrapping it around the tubing all the way up, soldering in place and creating springs. The next photo shows a lot of it has been done. Uh, the tank has been painted, so it's apparently on in place now. What I have to do now is the cab. The cab was set up for two operators. They have four burners and each guy had a wheel and a bigger wheel and one wheel would do one burner and the bigger wheel would do the other so one guy is doing two burners on two burners on one side the other guy is operating the burners on the other side so they would pull them up when they were going to travel when they're ready to burn stuff they'd lower them as close to the to rails as they could so forth this photo is looking down on it i'm working on the cab itself one of the problems i had was how can i have these small diameter angles coming up and keep them parallel to each other. And so what I did is I made, ultimately I made 10 of these little jigs. They're just strip wood with a bolt through it and a nut. And so I could take and crank them down. Once I get the, the parts parallel, then they would hold them there. And then I could solder stuff, the floor, for example, of the cab in place while they're being held there. I've already painted some of the stuff because that's going to be under the cab and I was not going to be able to paint it later. Here's the model. It's about six inches long. Uh, like I said, it's O scale or 148th scale. 
all scratch built except for the wheels. The, um, basically what this was doing, it was being pulled this direction. This is the diesel fuel which ran this engine right here. The engine was power for the pump here that blew the air, forced the air out, and there was a diesel pump right over here that it powered that actually drove the diesel and ran it up here. Right there is igniter. And so what they would do, this would be the very first blower that they were going to work with. These blowers were initially close together, parallel. This one would be started off and there's igniter right here coming off of the magneto that was on this engine. And that would torch that one off, which would torch this one off, and they would all be on fire. They could cut the power to any of them, and so if they got to a place where they didn't want, say they're coming to a bridge, uh, they've got to cut the fire on all of them because they don't want to burn the bridge up. So it was an interesting operation. The a later model had a battery and a starter motor, and so just push a button and the engine would start up. I think it was a four-cylinder, something like that. Uh, this earlier model that the YV bought had a crank and a magneto, and you can see the crank on this other side. I've turned it around, and here's the crank on the motor. The specifications listed the manufacturer of the, in, of the motor. I was able to go online and find a historical society for that manufacturer, and they had a restored motor just like the one in this, this weed burner. There was a photo of it which gave me the color, and they also sent me a drawing of the motor. So I built the motor. Here's all you can see of the motor, but I know it's there. Okay, this is looking at the front of the weed burner because, remember, it's going to go this direction. So these guys are working backwards all day long. They don't know where they're going. They've just seen what's happened. Uh, if we actually zoom in, you can see the two wheels that I mentioned for each guy. On one side are the valves to turn on the blowers and so forth, uh, and the igniters. Um, not much in the cab other than that. Painting was pretty easy. One challenge was the lettering. It was black lettering, so I could print my own, which I can't do if it was white. I was able to find the Fairmont logo online and replicated all the lettering that's on the prototype. Usually on projects, I will put the decals on, flatten them, and so forth, and then do an overspray of the color of the boxcar, whatever it is, uh, in order to make them look like they're not brand new. These don't look like they're brand new. They look like they've been out there for a while. But I didn't do that. What I did instead, since I was making my own decals, I made the decals using Photoshop, and then I changed the opacity of the artwork in order to fade them. And you can see here, I wasn't sure how it was going to work, so I had one set. The top set is fairly, uh, is actually hasn't been changed at all. The next step was a little bit more, and the bottom step was even more. So when I finally printed them, I printed them on decal paper, of course, and I, I know that I tried them on something ahead of time to pick the ones I wanted. I didn't want them to completely fade away, but I didn't want them to look like new. So that was kind of an interesting approach. So I'm not sure how long it took me to build that. I'm guessing six months or so. Um, I was retired, so it wasn't a matter of working only on Saturdays or something. But the project got bigger. Um, I entered this in a regional National Model Railroad Association contest, took 134 out of 135 points. Not bad, but it got, got me thinking that what if I kept on going? So what I decided to do was to build a diorama about three feet long, maybe, I don't remember exactly, 18 inches wide or so, to display this. And it would show it, not with fire coming out, but show it on some track, going across a bridge or something, whatever, in a scene, so people could enjoy the scene and so forth. And the scenery on my layout had been done for years, so it gave me a chance to actually start doing some scenery 
using the newer techniques of the, where you shoot the grass on. When I built my layout, it was all a squeeze bottle. So remember the letter that the Fairmont Motors Company sent me listed that they bought this plus the extinguisher train. In other words, two more cars. So I decided to build those. First thing I decided to build was the Fairmont T27. Here is a specification sheet that I was able to get hold of that talks about it, gives some basic dimensions and so forth. I also got in touch with the now retired curator of the California State Railroad Museum because he is a very knowledgeable rail fan type of person. And he mentioned that the Sierra Railroad had a homemade extinguisher car on the Sierra Railroad, which is now part of a, a state park called Railtown 1897. I got in touch with the restoration manager there and got permission to go on site and measure up that car. Here's a photo of it sitting out in front of the roundhouse. And I measured it up, took photos and so forth. And one thing I do, I've been measuring cars and equipment for a long time. And what I used to do, I would have a clipboard and I would measure something and then I'd write a description of what I just measured. Then I came up with a, an easier way of doing it. And the first one that I measured up was a stock car, why you stock car? And I had a scale drawing or a sketch of it. And I labeled everything that I wanted dimensions on, overall length, the width of the boards, the width, width of spacing between the boards, and put a letter by it, A, B, C, so forth. And then when it was on site, took my tape measure, I would see what A was, and I would measure it and write it down. B, measure it, write it down, so forth. That evolved into, once we had digital cameras, of measuring something, so I would measure the length of a car, I would take a photo of where the zero point was hooked to on the car and the other end of that particular item and take a close up. So now I had, not only was it what I was measuring, but the actual length of everything. So that's what I did on this car. I measured everything and just took pictures. Must have 75 photos of the end of my tape measure and the next picture is the other end. When I got all done, I shared some of that information with the, that curator and it turns out what they had was a Fairmont. It was not a home built. So I had an actual car that I could model from. So here is my model of that car. It was pretty simple. I think it's except for the deck, which was wood, that is wood, everything else is metal. The problem I had is if you looked at the photo of the real car, I'm not sure if it shows, but the engine was gone. But there's a lot of stuff stored all around that in that park uh, where visitors can't get to. And I was able to find one of the motors or engines like used in this particular car. And I took pictures of it and measured it. If you look at this picture of that motor, it had two big flywheels on it. And that nearly stalled the project. I could not figure out how I was going to model those two flywheels. And it was two flywheels on this car and two flywheels on another car. So that's when I started 3D printing, 3D drawing. Um, I don't have my own printer as I've mentioned before. But this one, I started out with a pretty difficult project to draw in 3D. And I didn't have a clue of how to do it. Fortunately, I had been corresponding with a person in, that used to live here in the San Francisco Bay Area that needed some decals, and I got him the decals he wanted, and I wrote to him because he was doing 3D printing a long time, I keep saying 3D printing, doing 3D drawing a long time before I was. And I explained my problem, I gave him a, a drawing of the flywheel itself, and he sent me a sketch back and said, what you do is you've got draw up one of the arms coming out and the rim and then you do this and this and this and once I did that it was a very simple way to do it so um, that solved that problem and I was on my way so this was the extinguisher car pretty simple um, but that was not all they had 
they also had another car. So this is the extinguisher car. This carried 500 gallons of water. It had an engine. It was not self-powered, but it had an engine that ran the pump to, and the hoses would be hooked to that pump and so forth. This was another car, no engine or no motor, but another 500 gallons of water. So these would be hooked together and uh, like that. And you also need something to pull these two cars. As I mentioned, they were not self-powered. So this is a Fairmont S2. It hooked up like this. This one, the motor is completely visible. So I could have faked this. I don't, I won't do that, but I could have faked putting a motor in this one, but I had to put a motor in this one. This also has the um, flywheel and so forth on the axle. Not too difficult. So that gave me all three cars that accompanied the weed burner. This is a Fairmont A6 heavy duty gang car. This was used to pull the weed burner. Again, this was actually a pretty simple model. There is an engine, but you can't see it unless you turn it over. But uh, everything is kind of hidden on this, so this was pretty simple. I did buy tools and so forth for it. So now I had all five pieces of equipment that were part of a weed burning operation. I think I've mentioned in previous videos that 3D drawing is addictive. I've done clinics on it and I actually have warned people attending my clinics that if you get into it, it's addictive. It's easy to do. It's if you're getting a product out of it um, and you're always trying to think of more things you could do with 3D printing. This project was no different. I thought about a canvas water bag. My father was a trucker back in the 40s, 50s, and I remember he had them. What it is is a canvas bag that water leaks out of, and that tends to cool the water off, even if it's out in the sun. I went online and I found this photo of a real desert water bag, and I drew it up, have it right here. From that same photo, I made decals and I lettered my water bag. Then I started thinking, okay, these guys are taking a break because something's wrong with the burner or something. So I went online and I found a straight on side view of a old lunchbox and a thermos, the old kind of thermos where you take the top off and that becomes your glass. So there's the cup, there's the thermos, and here's the lunchbox. I would show you the diorama if I could, but I built it, took 124 points out of 125 in a regional NMRA contest. When it was all done, I took some parts of it off and trashed it. Um, here's how I got to there. Um, outside of Merced, out in the grassland areas was a bridge. When I first went there in the early, late 70s, uh, that bridge, railroad bridge, was still there. Here's a photo of it. There was a creek going under the bridge called Edendale Creek. This photo was taken from the highway, looking at it. I don't think I had the guts to go take a measurements on it. In fact, I know I didn't. Uh, but I decided that would make a good scenic element for this diorama. So basically it had the bridge, Edendale Creek flowing under it, the roadbed is on a raised area, piece of track and so forth, some trees, bushes and so forth. Okay, I did save a few things. Uh, this was a, another construction project, so I had to save this. I used photo etched tie plates. There are three hole tie plates like the YV used. You see a bolt here, goes through bolts on the sides. You'll see on all the bridges that I built, and I didn't even know this was what they did, is the ties go on and then this piece here is actually let into the ties. So they're keeping the ties from moving this direction. So I milled all those out like you're supposed to. It was kind of cool. And this track went on for a foot one direction and a little over or a little under two feet the other direction. I had to have Bob Wire because this is out in, in the cattle country. And so 
I made my own bob wire, but I made a, a tool that I recall was about, well, in fact, it was a little over three feet long because I needed three feet of bob wire to go from one end of the diameter to the other times six. Three wires per fence, six wires. So what this thing did is I put some real, real fine wire, like number 28 or number 30, extremely fine wire, put three pieces in it and a little crank, cranked it, and every one crank full, every single crank, I would put a cross piece in for the bar. Crank, another piece, crank, another piece in. Then when I got all done, I soldered all those barbs in place and then trimmed them off. And so this is what I ended up with. It is bob wire. You run your finger across it, you can feel those barbs. Looking at photos, prototype photos of the YV in this particular area, there were telephone poles inside the fence line. And that was an easy way to have a place to put the telephone poles without having to buy right away. Nowadays, they would put them in the, in the public right away. Um, those days they didn't, and I'm not sure why. But the telephone company made a deal with the railroad that the railroad and its employees could get telephone service for free in exchange for having telephone poles in the right-of-way. So originally these were for telegraphs, and so these are the telegraph wires, which by this time were gone. The YV switched to telephones in 1930, and this is 1942 or 43. The insulators on here are 3D printed out of clear material so that you can actually see through them. I actually had a guy that worked for the telephone company and was familiar with these and he held these up real close to him. He says, oh, those are Heming Gate so-and-sos. So, -and, -so. so uh, and that's what I used. I used an actual drawing of one of these um, insulators to make mine. Now you'll see a little red tail hawk. There's his red tail. There was a guy who lived in Canada. I don't know if he had a website or he, there was a friend of his that would come to model shows that is still in business that does automobiles and so forth, period automobiles. And um, so I wrote to the guy and said, I'm building this diorama in, o in O scale. Can you make, or do you have a hawk? And he said, no, I don't have any. I said, well, I really want to make a red tail hawk. That's very prevalent at, in this particular area. And the guy did. And he sent me two red tail hawks, this one and this one that's flying. So on the diorama, you'll see a picture. This telephone pole is up like this, and this guy is studying a rabbit hidden behind a, a bush over here. This guy is diving to the ground, and there's a squirrel running away. So uh, that's some of the stories that go along with it. Now let me show you some photos of the diorama. I'll we'll start with this particular photo. It shows five of the people involved. These guys have stopped and so they're chatting among themselves. The figures are from a company in New Zealand. They're low scale. And as I recall, he made figures based on photos of West Side employees. And so I actually bought two packages because one package might have five figures, three of them were where I wanted, but the other two, their shirts are off because they're working, and in the 40s they didn't do that. They didn't take their shirts off. Here is a photo of a YV section crew. In this particular photo, they are restoring track that after it was washed out in a 1937 flood. Look at the guy on the extreme left. He's looking right at the camera. Here's this guy on the diorama. It just struck me when I looked at this photo and saw this figure and I thought I'm going to paint this guy up just like it was in the photo. Look at this photo. The guy on the right is my figure I was just talking about and the one that was in the prototype photo. This is what blows me away. It was so cool to be able to do that. No one except myself knew it, but I knew that it added to the figure because it was a real person. Okay, here's a, a shot pulling back a little bit. If you look in the upper left of this photo, you would see the telephone pole that had the red tail hawk in it. 
look down in the right corner and you can see a rabbit hiding behind a bush. You can also see that barbed wire fence. The original plants, when I was thinking about the diorama, would be you would be on the roadside looking at the scene because that's how I saw the bridge. I didn't see it from the private property side. But as I got into it, I realized one of the problems was going to be what to do with this creek. If the creek runs off of the, the diorama, it always looks kind of wrong. But if it starts in the diorama and runs downhill under a highway bridge, then it disappears like you would expect and you don't question it. Uh, at least that's how I see them. So I had this highway and I only modeled maybe two real inches of the highway. Uh, I modeled the bridge and so forth. But I wanted people that could see, because people could walk around it when it was in a contest room. I wanted them to understand that it was a highway. So I put a highway sign. There was a person I might have mentioned before, a California person that collects highway signs. And on his website, he has pictures of all these signs. So I took some of those pictures, reduced them to HO scale, and those are all the signs, the highway signs on my layout. They're actual highway signs in California. This one is too, and at the very bottom it says AAA, which means AAA installed it. Uh, it was the only sign that I could figure out belong there. I can't have a stop sign, couldn't have a highway sign. So this one is open stock range, bullet holes through it. So I took the photo, mounted it on some metal, and drilled holes through it, trying to drill equal to either a 22 or a 38 pistol or something, so it was realistic. And more of the barbed wire fence. This is looking from the other direction at the bridge. One of the trees is there. The highway's on the other side. This photo was actually taken outside, and I actually had a long, three-foot-long section of a photo in that same general area that I could use to mask the back side of it. This is how I have seen fences in California when they come to a seasonal waterway where it dries up in the summer and it's wet during the winter and you're running cattle. So they run the fence across it. They don't let the bottom of the fence get into the water because it's going to crush trees and bushes and so forth. So it's suspended by the bob wire across there. You can see on one of the fence posts, it's got a little bit of garbage on it and then flowers and so forth along the side. So here's the A6 coupled to the weed burner. One guy is trying to check something on the weed burner. The superintendent is going somewhere, I'm not sure. I don't have photos of the whole entire scene because it was too big, to, you know, wide angle. So this is the other major element of that. Here's the final shot of the day. The sun is starting to go down. You can see where the weed burner was in relation to the, the bridge and the fence and so forth. And I did string telephone wire between all of the telephone poles. That does it for this video. I hope you maybe got inspired to maybe think of some things that you might want to do. Think outside the box. Try something that's maybe a little harder. I can guarantee you that when you do that, the reward back to you is really, really deep. You know, when this project was coming along, when I got the grass in and the track was in and, you know, I needed some trees and pretty soon I thought, I need poppies, California poppies, so forth. And it just grows. And like I said, you, you start 3D drawing and pretty soon you're drawing water bags. So um, have fun out there and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.